thanks for coming out. And this is our final workshop, number six. <laughs> Boy, it's a day I've been looking forward to. <laughs> for those of you who don't know me, I'm John Kiefer. I uh, happy to be here on behalf of, of your arts. You can kind of lay out our plans for the Art Center project, both what we have accomplished today and some some future benchmarks that we're going to be working toward. Um, more importantly, after I give you all this information and make a brief presentation, we really want your ideas, your comments, your feedback, your involvement. One of the things we realized early on in this whole process was this Art Center project is not going to work unless it's a real community-based, community-supported effort. There's lots of moving pieces. And we're going to talk about how we're going to move forward through the rest of the process that we have. Um, but more importantly for tonight, we're going to show you the architectural renderings we now have, which will help you visualize what this Art Center could be like. Um, so I'm going to give a brief presentation just recapping the history of the building. Um, and then I'm going to show you some architectural renderings. And one really cool thing we're going to do is show you, walk you through a virtual 3D tour of the building as it exists right now. People always say, hey, I want to go in and take a look. I want to see what's inside the building. Well, if you have a couple thousand dollars, you want to pump down on hazmat suits and refrigerators <laughs> and an old hazmat company. What happened several years ago that the roof of the structure started leaking pretty good. Uh, the city eventually re uh, replaced the roof. But in the meantime, this small infestation took off and got worse and worse and worse. I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, so the city, because of that, decided back in 2014 or so to move to their new facility where they, the new city hall up on House Street. The police department stayed there for another year or so. They were located in the back of the building on the first floor. Um, the other issue that the building has always faced is not ADA compliant at all. And they were holding the public meetings on the second floor and people with disabilities weren't able to make it up the stairs to attend those meetings, they, they tried some alternative stuff. But basically, it's an old building, it's not ADA compliant, and it's full of mold, and probably lead paint, and probably asbestos too. <laughs> so, we're excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I want to lay out some of the benchmarks we've already hit, and some of the benchmarks ahead of us. We learned early also in this process not to put date certain on deliverables. In other words, we could not say we will have an architect hired by such and such a date. We realized we just have to follow a sequence of events. One of the huge ones was being able to reach back out to the general public, do these presentations, and get feedback. Um, what happened we had a whole series of these kind of meetings scheduled, and the last one we did was in 2020 at Uncorked, uh, the, the wine shop, and the next day the city closed down. So all the workshops we had scheduled back then were, were canceled. So we've been able to pick back up. So like I say, the involvement of the community is just huge. Um, this, by the way, is a painting that was given to Up Yards or presented to Up Yards to use was Prana Chalabay uh, out of St. James did this several years ago and she goes, hey, guess what? I want you guys to really use this painting so it's, it's really cool. Um, and like I say, most important for this meeting, we want your input, your comments, and I will be recruiting you because our final we have two final huge benchmarks to achieve. One of those is to begin a new nonprofit organization, probably a, a nonprofit corporation, that will take the project over from up your parts. We realized pretty early on that with all the other things we are doing with up your arts, the Art Center project, we're just not equipped to take it all the way to completion. 
but there's plenty of folks in this area who have the skill set um, to help move this project forward. So we're looking at starting a new official uh, nonprofit organization with separate board of directors from up your arts and an official membership as part of that volunteer membership, part of that organization. And then the final benchmark we have to hash out is what the long-term relationship this new organization will have with the city of Southport. There's various models that are out there. The one we initially started working with, if you're familiar with Franklin Square Gallery, that building is still owned by the city of Southport. The Associated Artists rent it back for one dollar a year and they have to renew the lease every nine years and 11 months. If I understand correctly, there's a state law that if they lease it for 10 years, the city would have to declare it surplus property and put it up for sale. Mm -hmm. So we, in discussions with the alderman and various folks, we decided we need to find a longer term model so we're not renewing every nine years and 11 months. Uh, so we've looked at, begun basically to look at some other organizations, some other private-public partnership models that are out there through North Carolina and across the country as well. And that's, we're just beginning that process. Um, for those of you who don't know, Up Your Arts, we started in 2017 to support and enhance the creative and um, performance arts throughout the area. So we support all the live music, all the art, all the theatrical, and we're going to get to the dance dance piece of it. <laughs> um, we also do a lot of events, some of them, most of them in partnership with the city of Southport. The Plein Air Festival, we've done it the last several years. Uh, this year it's going to be a three-day event. It's been two in the past. And I think I can go ahead and share this news about what we're going to do for judges. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah every year we like last year, we invited musicians to judge the artists, because artists go to hear musicians play, and they're always judging them. So <laughs> last year, we had some of the local music groups, I think Lunar City, Lockwood, and a couple others, judge the artwork, because on the final day of the Plain Air Festival, we have a wet paint sale. The artists set up their work, and we send these judges throughout. And then we have a People's Choice Award. And I think this year, we're looking for 75 artists to take place. So we needed some really qualified judges. So who's more qualified to judge than real judges? So we have six Brunswick County Court of Judges. <laughs> the judge. <laughs> sir, sir, I helped us set that up. That's it. It's going to be a really good event. Lots of people, you guys, can, like come and introduce yourself. We're on some boats. <laughs> um, so, um, so the, one of our big events throughout the year, or throughout the summer months, is the open mic we sponsor every Thursday night at the American Fish Company. This has become quite quite the tradition. We've done. I think we're starting our fifth year now. Four, four or five years. Um, it keeps getting better and better. Uh, we also have been involved in this crazy Fourth of July festival, which keeps changing every year because of COVID and whatnot. Uh, last year, we provided music for all the community stages, several over on Oak Island. This year, we're still going to do all the community live music events, but it's, the festival is going to be centered just in Southport with the exception of the first day on July 1st, which is Beach Day, so there will be activities over on Oak Island. Uh, and we're using our involvement with the 4th of July Committee to really promote the local musicians. The local music community here is just really, really wonderful. Let me start counting the number of musicians in this room right now. <laughs> Hi, David. <laughs> Uh, as a side note, we're like constantly amazed by the musical and artistic talent that exists in the greater Southport area. And for, as an example, uh, a couple 
several weeks, a couple months ago now, this woman contacted us and said, I have something I would like to present to Up Your Arts for your Save the Hall project. It's a piece of art that I did. I said, okay, here we go. But this is fabric art, thread art. This was done on, a, on an electric sewing machine. Okay. So it's part of, I guess, what you would call um, the emerging art forms that a lot of people have uh, maker spaces set aside for, where there's 3D printing, cool stuff like this. And I'm gonna pass this around. Try not to spill it too much on my time. <laughs> that is all made from sewing machines. It's really incredible. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So over the last several years now, we've been working, discussing with various city officials, uh, what we can do to reimagine, readapt this building. Uh, before I go any farther, we have one of the city officials here I'd like to introduce. Karen Mosteller is one of our aldermen here in Southport. Mm -hmm. uh, see two members of the board of directors from Up Your Arts. Okay. Uh, my wife, Ryan Bray, is a treasurer, mm -hmm. and Eric, and John, John, who is one of our newest board members, also a bass player. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so it, it's a requirement, Tom, you can be on the board. Yeah, we, we have been working with the city. I think we're on our third city manager. Uh, this morning, Bonnie Theron, the new city manager, was in attendance at the workshop. Uh, and I tell you what, the city of Southport is lucky to have this one. She's she's incredible. Uh, from Connecticut, originally. So. Uh, okay. Those of you here who are not really familiar with the building, it was originally built in the mid 1850s. Okay, it was basically a, a, a rectangular shaped brick building. Brick. And some of those brick walls in there are two feet thick. I mean, it's a huge, solid structure. Over the years, um, you see better perhaps than some of these others. Um, this front porch was probably added on in the 1920s, kind of decorated. And then in the 1960s, they covered it in that beautiful gold tannish puke colored stucco. Um, and they added on two auxiliary wings to put back the building. We're assuming that one of the reasons that they covered it in stucco was after more than 100 years at brick, probably started deteriorating, so the fix was to cover the stucco. And whether that gets left there or part of the brick gets restored is a question for another day. Um, <coughs> the building served as the Southport City Hall from 1979 until 2014, I mentioned they moved out. Prior to that, it was the Brunswick County Courthouse. Um, so when you see the pictures of this upper room, the upstairs is one huge, gigantic room where the court used to be. Apparently, too, I just learned, this was the original office for the Brunswick County Sheriff's Office. He was right there in that window. Mm -hmm. uh, the building is in rough shape. Mm -hmm. That's mold growing on the inside there. Uh, and I need to credit Morgan Harper for providing these pictures of the mold, something she excels at. Uh, some more. So there's a reason why people are not allowed <laughs> in the building without you know, hazmat suits. Um, but we're inspired by the building. It's left the center of the municipal civil life, and its geographic location walkable downtown South. So we saw, decided that we're going to have this campaign, and we needed a name. Some guy came up with it. Save the hall, y'all. <laughs> Uh, I'm betting the same guy that named our organization Up Your Heart. I bet you. <laughs> Naming a nonprofit Up Your Heart. It'll <laughs> <laughs> never happen. <laughs> um, 
So in November 2019, we were getting serious about this project and wanted to do a feasibility study. So we entered into the first of a series of MOUs with the city of Southport to give us six months exclusive right into the building um, to see if it made sense to continue trying to turn it into an art center. And this is our lovely Up the Arts President, Tina Powers, signing the first of the, uh, official document to enter into this agreement with the city of Southport. So that first benchmark then was doing an in-depth feasibility study. We had to make entry into the building. We had to pay some remediation folks to go in and spray the inside of the building, put us in Timex suits, respirators, booties, tape gloves, the whole nine yards. Um, but we were able to get into the building. Rich Bandera, uh, local architect, did all the as-built drawings. We hired an engineering firm out of uh, Wilmington, uh, to conduct a visual engineering survey. Um, we had a videography team go in there and do this 3D video tour, which I can show you in a few minutes, how you can visit and walk through the building on this tour. Um, and of course, we had some reporters all dressed up. So we had a good time stomping through the building, and I'm going to show you some of those pictures in a minute. Um, but we wanted to know, during a feasibility study, is this building salvageable? Is it structurally sound? Are there any real unknown deficits that would say, hey, we need to stop right here? Second, we wanted to make sure that we had broad-based community support. Okay. So we did some events uh, where we featured the Save the Hall campaign, just to kind of gauge public response. And it's been overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and it's been overwhelmingly positive working with the city of Southport on this project today. The final thing we needed to do in this feasibility study was to ask and answer the question, is this project going to be financially feasible? Because it's easy to come up with great ideas. I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but then my wife would say, well, how are we going to pay for this? We need to monetize some stuff. It's like, no, nah, we'll figure that out. <laughs> uh, so we did a feasibility study, we had the ad builds, we had the engineering surveys, and all that information is available on our website, upyourarts.org. We had started with some original program ideas, things we might want to incorporate into a performing creative arts center. Um, but we felt like it was going to be feasible to continue. So in July of 2020, we presented our findings to the Board of Government um, and decided to go ahead into more architectural development, more plan development, more organizational development to take the process forward. And now we are currently in a, uh, a longer term MOU with the city to work on our organizational development. By that I mean, <coughs> I say, Up Your Arts is not going to be the organization that takes this project to completion. We are the lead agency to get it off the ground, to begin it, to provide all the architectural services, but we cannot do it by ourselves, so we are going to raise up a whole separate corporation to take the program over. We'll still have representation on that corporation, but we're going to be reaching out to the various stakeholders throughout the greater Southport area to staff and bring in membership on that new uh, nonprofit organization. From the faith communities, the business communities, the local residents, obviously, um, all of the nonprofits, and we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, so, like I say, we were doing a whole bunch of of public presentations like this when we got stopped by the COVID thing. And every time we do a public presentation, people come up with great ideas. Uh, apparently, uh, the latest buzz thing around Southport is we need activities for high school and junior high and, and younger kids, uh, after, afternoon art programs or whatever. And I always raise my hand and I'd say, there's no kids in Southport, come on. <laughs> We're all retired adults. But apparently there are some kids around here that 
intent to put that me. Ah, I'd like to stop right here and give a shout out to a brand new arts and music program that Southport Baptist Church has just kicked off the last month or so, where they're giving art and music instructions to individual kids. It's like the arts academy, they're called. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, but every time we do a presentation, it's a time to talk, more ideas come forward. So we adjust the architectural plans, we uh, um, adjust our overall thinking of how this is all going to work out. So, to introduce where we started thinking and what we wanted to do, these are the very, very original floor layouts that kind of will denote some of the activities we want, some of the programs we want to have involved in the building. Very, very rough. This looks a lot different from what you'll see from our architect. Um, this, to acclimate you, this is the first floor. This would be more street up top here. We wanted with that nice front yard to do something very interesting, like uh, sculpture gardens, informal sitting area, maybe a small little bandstand, gazebo kind of thing, where you could meet your friends there and just sit in the front yard, enjoy chamber music. Um, just, there are very few informal gathering spots around the city of Southport. I like to say, if I have to meet somebody for a casual conversation or a small business meeting, I head right to Wall Street Market. You know, sit out in the courtyard there, whatever. But we want to design and incorporate throughout this whole structure, inside and outside, <coughs> places to sit, watch artists at work, listen to small concerts, plan on coming that evening for a larger concert. This all kinds of things, but think informal community gathering space. <coughs> you come in, we wanted the entryway to be very welcoming. We wanted it to be informative. Everything else goes on in this area. This will be an information resource hub. You want to know who's playing music, or what art events are coming up. That information will be available right there. Throughout here too, similar to what, if you're familiar with the Torpedo Factory in Alexandria, Virginia, uh, art space in uh, Raleigh, uh, even artworks up here in, in Wilmington, where there are artists working at their crafts, where you can sit and watch, and enjoy watching them. And of course, then they would want to go sell their stuff in a retail gallery. Um, but also, nonprofit resource center. I need to come up with a better name for that. But here's the deal. There are scores of really cool, great, active nonprofit organizations throughout this part of Brunswick County. New Hope Clinic, Matthews Ministry, Hope Harbor, the Alzheimer's, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. But they're scattered throughout the county. So our idea was to get one physical location where they could all have a presence, whether it's just rack cards or different people from different organizations, available as docents, whatever. So if you retire and come to Southport and want to get involved in something, which is the demographic here in Southport, people with who retire, move here, not have expendable time, creative urges, and hopefully, hopefully, some disposable income. <laughs> That's good. Uh, but if they wanted to volunteer their time, they could walk in to this nonprofit resource center and say, hey, what can I do? I want to I work with wildlife. Well, here's Seabiscuit uh, Wildlife Center is represented here. I want to work with folks with Alzheimer's. Here's information on them. So kind of a clearinghouse for nonprofits. Um, so we thought that would be cool. We originally had a small little catering, staging kitchen because if you're going to get it for informal meetings, you want to have a cup of coffee, maybe a glass of wine, obviously a beer. Make your laugh this meeting. Come on, over. <laughs> you guys are. Um, so we wanted to have a little cafe food service of some sort. Of course, we called that the meet and group cafe. 
And we originally had stuck it up here on the second floor. This is as you come up the stairs, you come through these double doors, and that's the huge area where they used to have their, um, their court stuff. We put a stage there, green rooms, dressing, because for this to be self-sustaining, we're going to have to do like wedding receptions, special events, and somebody pointed out to me earlier today, you know what you're going to have a lot of demand for? Retirement parties. Already <laughs> 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 retired. Um, so that's what we first started started out with. Um, and when we started putting these ideas together, we decided that we needed some outdoor, some outside expertise from the community. So when we talked about having a community garden, informal sculpture garden, we reached out to the Southport Garden Club. Within two or three days, here's all these plans for outdoor garden space. They were excited to be involved in this, and thank for that. When we wanted to look at what we would do in retail space, we reached out to Hillary Meehan, the founder of Maintenance Gallery, um, and said, Hillary, and she's also done architectural design in the past as well, um, what do we need to consider, what do we need to think about in retail space for artwork? What do we need to consider for gallery space? How is the best to set that up? So Hillary gave us a nice little stack of papers and said, you need to think about all these things. I go, well, thank you very much for doing that. Um, when it came time to talk about the nonprofit resource center, we reached out to Sheila Roberts, who's the director of the New Hope Clinic. Um, very dynamic organization. She's a very dynamic leader in the nonprofit. And she gave us a big stack of, hey, you want nonprofits in here? Here's all the things you need to have in there. Here's all the things you need to have. Consider. Um, and so we reached out to those folks throughout the community <coughs> to kind of give us input. And I, I do want to also give credit to Tom Daniels, who's here, retired from Ohio State, correct? Ohio University. Ohio. I knew I was going to get it wrong. Down the road. <laughs> the other place. <laughs> so let's say you got the Chiefs and the Bengals and the uh, <laughs> Oh, it's just the Bengals. John was instrumental when we were assembling all these ideas because you had done a similar project on the campus, correct? I recall. After I retired from my professorship and hung around for six years, working on a $38 million capital project for my college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we picked his brains early. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've given him some time off. <laughs> but you went on that next committee. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. <laughs> I like the way you think you're going to be on the recruitment committee. <laughs> When we talked about what we could do in this upstairs area here, we wanted not just expert state-of-the-art sound production, acoustic design, um, but we also wanted to be able to double as a theater kind of space, a plug-and-play theater with flats, lighting, everything built in. So for the sound production and audio systems, we reached out to two individuals, Jason Pullins, local sound producer here, and Jamie Hoover, a local music producer, who also teaches audio recording at the college. Hey, buddy, I'm fun. Um, and they immediately started scrapping up the sides and the cords, which connectors we're going to use for all this production stuff. I go, guys, stop. Okay, put your ideas on paper, give it to us. We'll send them back and give it to the architect. We'll bring an acoustical engineer to set that stage. But they gave some great ideas and things to think about. For having a stage, area, we reach out to Henry Bridges, who most of you know, a local resident, was instrumental in creation of City Stage in Wilmington, was instrumental in the theatrical productions at the museum, but also was involved in the founding and creation of Brunswick Little Theater. So he gave us a nice stack of papers too, you know, drawings of flats, how you can move all the stuff around, and so forth and so on. For the meet and greet cafe and the, the Initial kitchen idea, we reach out to Andrew Lang from Moore Street Market. 
and also um, Beverly Bridges, who's a food and service, food and beverage service manager at the Southport uh, Senior Center. So she gave a nice stack of prices too. Andrew, in his defense, gave us one sheet of paper. <laughs> said, okay, yeah, you need some refrigerators. <laughs> so we appreciate that initial information. And every time we would talk, things would change. Instead of just having a warming catering kitchen, we decided, well, with a little bit more effort, a little bit more money, we can make a full commercial kitchen and do culinary arts classes there. And because we're already going to have a whole audio visual setup, we can live stream those classes and people could watch online. How cool would that be? I'm like, when I first heard this idea, I was like, who the heck wants to go to a culinary art class? Who wants to go to a cooking class? But that has been the crowd favorite. Okay. <clears throat> so we've had great input from the community. That's part of the process that will make it work, and we keep soliciting ideas. Uh, but overall, we want the state of the art, acoustical lighting, ready to go. All the music venues around here are basically either a restaurant or a bar, and they go, hey, look, over behind that dumpster, we could put a band there. <laughs> no, so it's all been adapted. The acoustics usually aren't that good. Yeah. We think state of the art acoustical concert hall where you can actually hear what's being performed. Um, we needed uh, to upgrade it so it obtains ADA compliant obviously and the informal gathering seating areas throughout the building. Just to think of going in there, Eric, I'll meet you there. Yeah, that's right. We had a couple of meetings with that. So yeah, we have. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Go in there, have a beverage, watch people paint in the background. That would be great. How cool would that be? Mm -hmm. um, so, every time we do a presentation or talk to people, the vision keeps growing and evolving. It's really cool. Um, the one thing, um, speak about some other art centers in various towns across North Carolina, but the one thing most of them have in common that we will not be doing is individual classes there in music or visual arts because we already have such a gym here in downtown Southport, Brunswick Community College, Southport Center, which is now 100% adult education for the performing and creative arts. And you go by there during the day, the parking lots are full. Pottery classes, Jamie Hoover teaches uh, digital production in there, silversmithing. Woodworking. Woodworking. Or quilting. Quilting, yeah, I mean, they just keep yeah. thinking. And we were, um, one of the reasons that we started up the arts back in 2017, they kind of reached out to us and they weren't quite sure what they were going to do with this campus. Uh, they were doing workforce development, GED training, I think they had a small nursing program in there, or a nursing assistant program. And we kind of helped them develop the initial arts curriculum, and that has really taken off. And they have become real supporters of everything we want to do. So we're not going to do individual instruction in the new um, arts center. We would just send people right up to the college. Uh, and so that gives us a lot more flexibility in how we use these spaces. I think we could do like skills workshops, you know, painting seminars, that kind of thing, but we're not planning on doing individual instruction. Um, and there are, I uh, will be real clear, there are some really cool artistic things. Franklin Square Gallery. It's an incredible project. All the local private galleries, all the music venues, and now you know, Southport Baptist doing this waterway music and the, um, the other little art center here on House Street. There was so much happening. We are not going to strive to compete with them at all. We're thinking by having this really nice state of the art performing and creative arts center in downtown, it's just going to rise all the ships, as it were, and be the real resource hub for all those other facilities. Um, okay. Um, okay, how many of you know, I think Eric might know this guy. 
This is the architect that we engaged, David Lyle. Mm -hmm. He used practices in downtown Wilmington. He was real instrumental in the renovation and restoration of the whole Brooklyn, Brooklyn Arts District up there. Uh, if any of you have been to the Edward Teach Brewery on 4th Street, it was an old firehouse, an old rundown firehouse. And he's the architect that redesigned it. And now it's a thriving kind of anchor of that downtown Brooklyn Arts District. More importantly for us, for us here, he was also the architect who did converted the B and T bank building at Howard North to Billings Way into what's now the Southport Market. If you ever used to go to that bank, I mean it was a bank. It was a bank. You know, you walk in there and go, this could never have been a bank. We think he did a really, really mm -hmm. great job. Um, so we were fortunate to have him when we reached the benchmark of hiring an architectural firm. We got some recommendations. We reached out to these folks and got responses like, boy, that's a cool project. I would really love to be involved in that. Can I call you back in three years? Mm -hmm. Literally, quote, three years. Because everybody at that point, COVID shut down, certain segments like the architectural industry just skyrocketed. Um, other people said, you know, I'd love to do that, but I just retired and I let all my staff go. So good luck. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but we were real fortunate to, to uh, be able to engage with David. He's been very great to work with. One of the commitments Up Your Arts has made as an organization is to pay for all the architectural fees on this project. So everything he's done to date is paid for. When we do some fundraising events, we always say save the hall. And that money is going directly into architectural services at this point. Like I say though, we are going to create a new organization that we're going to hand the project over to. Uh, we'll still be involved, but now before I show you the really cool stuff. That's one of his biggest renderings. Let me show you <clears throat> what we're dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. This is our virtual tour, and every time I try to walk through, I get stuck in the closet. So bear with me. This is the first floor coming in from the back of the building. So you're looking down at this long, long hallway with that very historic. Um, suspended ceilings in there, mm -hmm. out toward uh, Moore Street. But when you bring up this program, and it's available on our website, front page of our website, you can then look in all the little nooks and crannies, see what's there right now. And know why this building is in fairly rough shape. And it's also, over the years, they've added more and more office space small, so it's really cut up, cookie cutter inside. So the bad news is we're gonna to have to spend several hundreds of thousands of dollars doing mold remediation, because this is a total gut job, ripping it down to bare structural frame. The good news is we're not constrained by what is there right now, since most of this has to come out anyway. There are some, some cool features. Uh, I guess this is the one that was the old sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. kind of sheriff's office was there city years manager ago. was in there for city manager's office was there. Oh, they were. And then it was the court the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there are some cool architectural features. The building was placed on the historic, National Historic Registry in 1979. Not so much because of its historic architectural features, but it's a historic use as a civil and municipal center. It does have some cool architectural features, like this old, probably handmade woodwork, handmade windows, probably covered in handmade lead paint. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the areas, like I say, are, I'm not sure this is the men's room or the women's room, I've said to them, why do you put them in those bathrooms? They're dead, they're tucked away, they're cool. They go, they're not ADA compliant. They're not big enough. The entryways aren't big enough. 
Please read the okay, you can see. And this is when I start to get lost trying to find my way back. We go upstairs here. Again, that uh, the staircase is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. well, probably handmade came here. Um, but you can see if you look closely at this woodwork that's in there. It's all cracked, crazed, in bad shape. And apparently, you know, I can't swear to it. I a stormtrooper out there. It's not a ghost. There's a ghost in the dark. And they're all dressed in hazmat shoes. So when they did the, the video, the 3D video, they're doing lots of shooting, and these guys in hazmat suits will appear and disappear. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see some of the, the damage up there in the bowl. But you can also see the cool wood ceilings out there. Um, you walk up there, won't you? Look. <laughs> Three, two, one. <two. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Stop doing my job. <laughs> okay. We're going to get here. So you really get it disappeared, didn't you? Yeah. Hey, how'd you get up this? I told you I was going to get lost. <laughs> oh, here we go. That's the door. You're not lost, you're just disoriented. <laughs> <laughs> this is the existing hall I talked about. You've not been in there. It's a pretty spectacular room. Um, these old pews, I'm not sure where they ever, ever came from. But there, those two are covered in mold, but they could be cleaned remediated and probably maybe auctioned off as a fundraiser. Uh, this is where the city used to have their board meetings, their monthly meetings. Cool old architecturally significant stamp tin ceilings. Yes. Ceiling is just cool. Covered in mold. But it could be could be removed, cleaned up and reinstalled. Cool chandeliers are so, sold. And the dais where we will probably be staged on this end of the building. Um, and the behind here, somewhere leading out to another warren of halls and rooms, there's some back, back stairs. Um, well, they're not actually stairs, it's a rickety, broken down fire escape, basically, that lands on a broken down, rickety concrete ground. Um, and one of the reasons this is significant, we decided that we needed to add on to the back and improve the, uh, the secondary means of egress. For this to work, we need a certain level of occupancy when uh, we're having concerts or wedding receptions and so forth and so on um, to, to sustain the, the operations day to day. Um, what is determined the amount of occupancy? Is your square footage, your means of egress, and your fire suppression systems? So it's looking like uh, uh, rough estimates done by Richard Dara for the Arctic. So you should be able to, and, and also the usage. A studio space has a different occupancy than a theater space, or theater seating more than a uh, banquet facility. So we're looking at probably 250 people. 260, 70 people, maybe, to get in like, for, a, for a concert on that second, mm -hmm. second level. It's pretty cool. So how much does the community building That's only 200? About that. Mm -hmm. And that's... that's um, 60, actually. 260? 160. 160. 160. Yeah. And the interesting when thing about changes. the community building it's a nice venue uh, for wedding exceptions, special events. The acoustics are terrible. Um, I know David's played in there several times and try and make sound good, but that building is just not designed for live music. Uh, but it is booked up years in advance mm -hmm. for wedding exceptions mm -hmm. or retirement parties or whatever. So there is a built-in demand or it's another space like this, mm -hmm. kind of overflow. On what doing. Okay. Um, again, this 3D tour is on our website. Have fun playing with it, and hopefully, you don't get quite as lost as I do. <laughs>
it's in rough shape, but it's a challenge, and it's, it's going to be cool when we pull it off. Okay, let me get out of this real quick and get back to my slides. So, we took all these ideas we had and met with our architects several times. They gave us some initial schematics. We refined them a little bit, came back, and he, he did all these renderings so you get more of a feel for it. Now, I want to point out these are schematics, nothing is set in stone. This is more of giving you a feel of what it could be like on the inside of this building. We did not specify any furnishings, colors, material, or anything like that. This is what he generated. But the trick is, you have a historic building from the 1850s, 1920s, and 1960s. And we wanted to upgrade and modernize everything. And you know the trend, architectural trends, it's more of a contemporary feel. How do you integrate all that together? Uh, and we think he's done a real nice job. You know, we'll walk you through some of the, some of the things. Um, this is coming off Moore Street, walking in, that's what we would see. Wider hallways, bright and airy, and uh, glass walls where you can be partitioned off, and you could be out here looking through the windows, watching artists paint, something like that. So very open, but also some private spaces in there too. Um, a new entry area on the back for us to be flexible in all the activities we're going to do in there. We need lots of storage for chairs, tables, linens, whatever. Um, so we decided the best way to do that is put an addition on the back improve the egress, and then probably have a basement storage area with an elevator that goes right there to store all the tables and be able to change things over real quick. So this is kind of what it would feel like as you come into the rear of the building, uh, which I find very peaceful and, and, and kind of warm and inviting. That's the rendering of the upstairs hall. I really want to try to keep that same feel as much as we can. And this would be the meet and greet cafe, which is on the wing of the building uh, on Data Street, across from uh, Strings of Beyond. So that's a, again, open areas, glass, natural lighting, and so forth. Okay. So here's the existing building as it is right now. These are the two wings. Okay. So we're talking about a two-story addition with a basement, adding that on, on the back. To accomplish um, ADA compliancy, he designed this kind of round, semicircular plaza in front, where you would come in and a wheelchair ramp would go around. This would be a sitting area, you know, benches, whatever, but it would be um, ADA compliant there in front. This, okay, that is not a rooftop bar. <laughs> you be very clear about this in the current political climate. It's a rooftop sitting area. <laughs> it's not a rooftop bar. <laughs> One of the things, I, crazy ideas I had early on, is like, wouldn't it be great if somehow you get up on the roof, rooftop area, and you could have these views of the water down there? So he redesigned it and said, okay, I've got your rooftop sitting area right available for you. And it's pretty cool. Here's. Again, you have to go to a website to check this out because it's hard, hard to see. But the entryway in the front, the welcoming foyers, the nonprofit resource centers, revised bathrooms, private studio space, co op studio space, a smaller informal performance area, perhaps on the first floor, a culinary kitchen there, uh, the meet and greet cafe, the new entry on the back, elevators which will be large enough to accommodate moving, well, for maybe from the fire service. They have to accommodate a full stretcher. <laughs> they have to be open down. Yes. Uh, well, but there's a lot of equipment that have to be in there. They have a band's plan to be able to pull it in the back. And they can also design a covered portico back here. We can pull up out of the weather, unload, put your stuff right in the elevator, and take it right upstairs to the stage area. Very cool. And this is the layout of the second floor. Now, things like green rooms, dressing rooms for the bridal parties that would be in there. 
uh, a production booth, and perhaps a broadcast studio. One of the ideas that was kicked around several years ago was having a radio station here in downtown Southport. But we decided we could not call that WREV, which Rev was a little disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> he was having to get this project. And we always called the trigger man. This is before a Bjorn's funding. But Steve Port Pilot said, if you guys want to do a radio station, you can put it right in the front window here at Steve Port Pilot on Mark Street. So we came real close, and we were going to call it WSPT, not WREV. <laughs> uh, uh, but then we started thinking, you know, getting the broadcast lights and all that. Technology is well, we can do live streaming broadcast. Right. So we're having like an A-list act. My way of thinking, is, let's say we have <coughs> Amy Harris or James Taylor come and do a concert one night to have them do an hour-long streaming interview with them in the morning. Mm -hmm. We talk about the interview that, you know, their influence, all that kind of stuff. It would be interesting and help generate publicity for the event that night. Um, we can also use this to kind of oversee the production of the, the culinary art classes and stream those online. So a separate sound production booth and a separate broadcast booth. Cool. All right. So this is kind of a view of what the front of the building might look like. Again, trying to incorporate these kind of historic elements here in the front, and yes, it's not the show cupola up top, which is very historic for this building, but then the transition into a more contemporary streamlined look. You know, the, the, the main vista of the building is from Moore Street. When you're on those two side streets, which are very narrow, you don't get these long perspectives. You wouldn't be able to stand back and see the entire building, but you would get a feel for what it would be like. Um, again, Davis Street here, Moore Street out here, rooftop sitting area. This has a rooftop standing area. <laughs> Notice that the bar is all the way on the first floor. <laughs> Don't worry, Dave, there's an elevator. <laughs> okay. So we kind of we thought he did a nice job. Nice but workplace. Again, schematic. Nothing set in stone. As the program ideas develop, the architecture is going to change. And that's the new rear of the building with the, again, you can drive under a covered uh, overhang, off the way. So how are we going to get there? I'd say our biggest next task is in developing a new corporate organization to take the project over. And we have begun uh, devising our selection and recruitment process. You'll be hearing more about that in the days to come. If any of you are interested in serving on that new board, either as an official board member or as an officially recognized volunteer, we solicit your involvement. There's lots of moving pieces. But we are going to, like I mentioned, we're going to reach out throughout all the stakeholders and then the municipal folks, the faith groups, the nonprofits, the businesses, the residents, and draw so this really becomes reflective of the community as a whole. Okay. Now, over the last couple of months, as we started scratching our heads, okay, say we started a new organization, how is this arrangement with the city going to work out long term? This public private partnership that we're talking about. So it felt at first like we were reinventing the wheel, and then we decided to go on a couple little field trips and see what other towns have done. Now, I'm sure most of you recognize this building here. Maybe if you were a dairy farmer in the old days in Floyd, Virginia. Mm -hmm. okay. So Floyd, Virginia is in the bottom, uh, the southwest corner of Virginia in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Beautiful out there. It's become kind of a cultural mecca. They have Floyd Fest, uh, like a week-long uh, bluegrass festival. Uh, we were out there during the plein air weekend. And of course, the first person we ran into was Jim McIntosh out there for plein air. This is an old dairy barn, and we call them the hippies on the hill. 
the hippies said, okay, we need an art center here. Let's buy this old dairy barn and fix it up. City wasn't involved. This was just a group of people somehow raised some money and put together this art center in this really old dairy barn. And it's funky, it's collected, it's colorful, it's inviting. The back of it has some like outdoor pottery studios. It overlooks the mountains, very picturesque. Um, it takes a long time to get to Floyd, Virginia, particularly when it's raining up and down the mountains. I'll tell you that. They have retail spaces there. It's just a cool, cool, cool place. Again, one end of the spectrum. A nonprofit organization took, acquired this building, and converted it. On the other end of the spectrum, this is downtown Cary. Okay. And a part of town that used to be kind of desolate, not a lot going on right there. This guy is an executive director of the Cary Art Center. He spent two or three hours with us showing this facility. And what's unique about this facility is a totally municipally run organization and, and building. The city owns it, the city staffs it, the city staffs it, the volunteers, covers them in insurance. Everybody that works in this building is a city employee. Okay. It's pretty impressive. The state of the art theaters designed, because this was a, a building I think that was basically built from scratch. Everything state of the art, high tech, probably see for about 200, 250 people in there. The green room down below with a little elevator to bring the bands up. It was pretty cool. Here's an interesting thing, because folks always say, in Southport, boy, this development, we're going to lose the historic quaint feel of our cute little seaside village. Um, and yeah, it's changing. It's going to continue to change. You know, all the developments coming in, to, to this area, Southport is going to change. But we need to honor our historical past. Um, one of the ways that's done is through oral histories. This is a booth in the lobby of the Cary Art Center. It's an NPR story corps booth where you can go in and record your oral histories, whether or not your family, your military service, you know, something happened in the community. This is just cool, warm and inviting. We have a similar project that we kind of kicked off here in Southport. A friend of ours, Dennis Wall, uh, working on an oral history of the musical roots of Southport, which, you know, there's a reason why this is such a thriving music community, because it always has been. From the sea shanty singers down when there was a working um, seacoast fishing village to what is called the Chippen Circuit, when all these gospel groups would tour these black churches and play, you know, gospel concerts. The waterfront down here used to be lined with blues clubs. Over on Oak Island, Long Beach Road, then it had all these large dance halls at one time. So one of the ways of preserving this historic feel is through oral histories. Okay, and Dennis, is, I'm, I'm envisioning at some point when this is completed, we will have a permanent exhibition in the arts building of the musical roots of Sapport. Um, this is not a very good slide, but also to visual demonstrations and artifacts and, and um, exhibits to what's happened in the past. This is from their second story, overlooking a new sculpture garden in formal sitting area. And apparently, City of Cary used to not be that prominent. This art center really helped turn that community around. And this area in downtown Cary now is a real thriving cultural area. It's, it's really cool. Okay. And since they're municipal employees, if you talk to the tech guys, the sound guy is on city payroll. <laughs> and because they're municipal employees, they will talk your ear off for hours and ask them about their speakers. <laughs> Um, obviously, they're related to all these artistic groups, nonprofit groups, community groups. Uh, here's another art center. This is in downtown Carver. Okay. Um, 
This was kind of a hybrid, part of the city of Carlo, but also a non-profit. Put together this art center. Um, I think there's some performance space in there. They are in the process of moving around the corner to a slightly uh, larger facility. But again, they have historic displays. Uh, they have cool signage throughout. Uh, and to me, when I go into a facility that I'm not familiar with, having signage to find your way around is vitally important. So I should take a second to point out the signage in this room, that small sign. That's where the restaurants are. This <laughs> This reminds me of what's in our existing city hall here, old city hall building. Throughout North Carolina, there was a series of old theaters called Carolina Theaters, and they were spread throughout the region. Um, most of them burnt down, and most of them were bulldozed, or sold off by whoever owned them, whether it was in the college or whatever, um, and converted to offices or, or whatever. This one, however, it was in really bad shape. Look familiar? They, yeah. If I drop it some more, is it going to work better, Dave? A group said, hey, we're not going to let this thing get involved. this. So a group of citizens got together, formed a little group, said, we're going to save this building. They did not have a fancy name, but they pulled this off. And they, early on, they got the city involved. The city was really involved in this. Uh, now, this is in downtown Durham, in the American Tobacco District, which used to be not quite slums, but certainly a rundown area. Uh, so these people had some vision to step up and save this structure. Okay. They got the community involved. Those are all their donors and patrons. It's a community, regional-wide effort to pull something like this off. Uh, I'm going to start calling these people. This, kind of thing. <laughs> this is what it looks like right now. Okay. But here is the old theater. Uh, this is the um, uh, Durham Arts Council. I think has their facilities here. Uh, some other art related stuff that's going on. The whole area is revitalized. There's breweries down there, lots of great restaurants. All of these warehouses have been converted to loft housing. There's Airbnbs, everything's walkable. It's very, very inviting. And it's not the very bad crime ridden area of Durham anymore. That's about two miles down the road. Went there once. Here's another example of a repurposed old building. This is in downtown Raleigh. I uh, guess this is an old Ford dealership or something, some old building, converted into what is called art space. So this is working artists throughout this, I think it's a two-story building, it's been a while since we were there. Uh, really cool, but it has that energy of a working visual artist. Really cool. They have artists and residents, all kinds of exhibit. And great signage too. So, our benchmarks, we start out with some ideas, put it on paper, did a feasibility study, decided, yeah, this would work. We said to the city, okay, we want to continue this process. The city says, go for it. We refined our program ideas. We hired an architect. We've been working with them. Um, our programs continue to develop what we want to include. It's been suggested, for instance, that we need lots of activities for children, young people, that we can find them. You know, in art programs in the afternoons, perhaps, some of the musician folks have said, you know what would be really cool? If we could have live concert hall performance rehearsal space, mm -hmm. real run uh, And so lots of ideas keep generating and we keep kind of adopting our plans uh, with what we want to do. Um, so 
our biggest hurdle we're dealing with right now is developing this new organization. And then the final thing is going to be developing um, the contours of the public-private partnership that this new organization will have with the city of Southport. Not a nine, nine year program, but something a lot longer lasting. Because we're looking when we originally did the, did the ball course on the financial cost of this, um, you probably remember, we were looking at about a $2 million renovation, yeah. restoration. Activity. That's what was current 2019, 2020. Of course, we're adding another 1,000 square feet plus in the back of this addition. And prices have skyrocketed. Our architect now says you better plan on between 3.5, 3.6, 3.9 million. So I'm like, oh. <laughs> but we're also familiar with an art center that just got built and put together and opened to the public in Cornelius on Lake Norman. And the headline on the article is $25 million performing art center. <laughs> So when we're talking about three, four million dollars, I'm like, oh, we can do that. Dollar a day, dollar a day. This is as we're getting ready to go in and make entrance, and we're pretty sure that's Morgan Harper right there in the background, getting ready to go in there. So that's my presentation. Before you leave tonight, uh, after we have discussions and questions, we had two handouts. One is kind of a summary of the presentation. The other is an overall fact sheet on having, on how a thriving arts community impacts communities, their well-being, certainly their economic well-being, and so that's some good information. I also want to acknowledge Bob Surridge here from the Southport Historical Society. Um, one of our partners in this, uh, Bob's been great to work with and offered to come you did good tonight, John. You did good tonight, John. Oh, okay. Bob was involved. Uh, Bob enlisted our help with this opening doors project, which last year at our gala, we were, they were donated all these historic doors from the house on Moore Street, I think. Ginger Harper. Thank you. Ginger Harper. Uh, and we put out a call to artists, and they decorated all these doors. I'm like, you guys are nuts. This is never, I mean, I'm a creative guy. He said, this is not, and I'm not going to move any of those doors. <laughs> so they brought them around, we had them at the gallery, they, them, they exhibited them all around town, and then they auctioned them off. And made some big, big ones. So, and some phenomenal art. <laughs> and by the way, a little side note, stay tuned, because one of the other projects up at your arts is currently working on, information will be coming out in the next couple of weeks, is bringing art to more of the public spaces in downtown Southport. So think banners, think murals, all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, we'll be working with them, hopefully with downtown Southport Inc. Uh, on that project, which we're members and also members of the chamber. So, and all these organizations, the city, the historic society, downtown Southport, the chamber, have been so supportive to all the efforts Yards. I got news for you, by the way. I'll tell you later. Some more stuff is happening. Oh, really? I can't tell them. Okay. All right. We'll talk to them. We'll get the other Tuesday. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'll meet you there. Okay. 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 More street parts. Okay. <laughs> so that's my presentation. Comments, questions, follow up, observations. We're excited. It's a huge project. We need lots of help. Um, have you thought of giving your presentation up to St. James? Because I would say that the majority of volunteers, like the, the Friends of the Maritime Museum, most of those people live, up, live in St. James. The people who volunteer at the, um, the fort, those at the visitor center, they're also all, most of them are from St. James. I think they would be another group to reach out. And because a lot of people moved here to be in Southport, but they just happen to live in St. James. So they are a good resource for oh, us to help. And I think if you we, could we had some stuff scheduled there before we got shut down with COVID. We also had some presentations scheduled for Winding River, which is another mm -hmm. thing. 
which um, I guess if you're a musician, that's the first place you look to move to these days, uh, thriving in the music community there. So, and, and we just had some folks from Wine River at the last session, and they go, you know, we'll set you guys up to come and do that presentation. And during the same thing, yeah, we had you know, a lot of people. A lot of people there. Good idea. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'm curious, I'm a little bit of I was living in Alexandria when the torpedo factory went up, and it was really a group of artists mm -hmm. that wanted to use part, it was originally a torpedo factory during World War II, yeah. and um, in downtown Southport. And my mother was on city council and worked with those artists to make sure that would happen. Wow. So, she's like, so it's, they, it was just artists, and it was small, now it takes up three city blocks, I guess. Yeah. So it's, and they added on, it was like tremendously huge, but yeah. as a friendly art space, to look at what artists are doing while they were doing it, it was always very amazing. Alexandria, and that's white on their waterfront there, or a half a block from the waterfront? No, it's on the waterfront. Yeah. Their back now is right on the water. It's, it's such an exciting place to go. So mm -hmm. here we have a similar facility, mm -hmm. almost right on the water. Well, arts and music. And well, I was emphasizing the, the fact that the council worked with the artists to get this building. But the city actually owned, the government gave it to them after World War II when they closed down the torpedo factory. So the city owned it. So that was interesting. They worked together, and that's what was very important. And so, and we, uh, the, the city is going to maintain ownership of this building. And it was improved in rehab. I think it might improve the city's bond rating just a little bit because it's an asset that just will be mm -hmm. much more valuable than it is right now. Um, we are definitely, this partnership with the city, and like I say, they've been very, very supportive, is really essential to make this project work because if we're funding through uh, community development grants, historic investment tax credits, where we're looking for most of the money to fund uh, you know, the renovation, uh, that goes to the city. It comes through our partnership with the city. So that's a real, a real vital partnership. Uh, we'll obviously also be looking for corporate sponsors, um, naming rights, individual supporters, uh, non reaching out to the other nonprofits to kind of get everybody involved, not just in programs, everything we do there, but helping to financially get behind this project from the get go. It's been a number of years since I was at the Torpedo Factory. Mm -hmm. I want to go see it. Oh, yeah, that's huge. Well, tell me if you're going, I'll ride up with you. Okay. Yeah. I got a free place we can stay. Yeah. Other questions, comments? Okay, it might be another time. <laughs> <laughs>